In these turbulent times, it can feel like the world is only getting darker and more uncertain. But amidst the chaos, a revelation awaits. The revelation of Jesus Christ unveils the true person and work of Christ, standing against the powers of darkness. It reveals the spiritual realm, the future, and the profound mysteries of John's visions. Join us as we explore the timeless truths and deep revelations woven into this extraordinary biblical story. From the triumphant Lamb of God to the cosmic battles between good and evil, the Book of Revelation offers both a warning and a beacon of hope for believers in every age. In the face of uncertainty, Revelation inspires us to hold steadfast in our faith and hope in the God who holds the future in His hands. Will you bow to the fleeting powers of this world, or will you bow to the One who is worthy? For us, as we move on, please turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4, as we'll be covering chapter 4 and 5 today. If you're here last week, you know that we covered those seven letters in one sermon. Each of those cities really dealing with their own set of challenges, their own set of obstacles. And you might be asking, what's the connection between that section and the section that we're covering today? The connection is that all of the challenges, all of the problems that the seven churches were facing are solved by getting their eyes onto this throne room scene in chapters four and five. The connection is that the seven churches that John addressed were either struggling or compromising or both, and what they all needed was to get a vision of this God who reigns on his throne. In the last section, we saw this repeated command to overcome, to conquer, to be victorious, but the question is how? How do we overcome? How do we conquer? How can we become victorious? The answer is we need to get a vision of what's going on in this throne room scene today. And so the title of my message is A Vision of Heavenly Worship, and we'll see three questions being asked and answered in the text. Who is the one on the throne? Who is the one who's worthy? And who are the ones who will sing? Part one is about the throne, part two is about the scroll, and part three is about the multitude. Today's passage is about worship. Who do we worship? Why do we worship? How do we worship? Can I make a confession this morning? I confess to you that I do not feel adequate or fit to preach on this amazing passage today. That's not because there's any hidden sin in my life. It's simply because the picture of our God in this chapter that we have here is just richer and higher and more glorious and deeper. And I don't have the words to convey to you what we see here. And so today, my prayer this morning throughout the week is that God's people would hear a better sermon than the one I'm about to preach to you, that he would somehow give you eyes and ears to see this all captivating, all sufficient, all glorious glorious God who sits on this heavenly throne. We're given an invitation in chapter 4, verse 1 that reads this way. John says, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. That's the invitation for John, and that's the invitation for you and I this morning, that we would come up here. In this passage, we are transported to a transcendent place, to another realm. We're seeing reality from some other side. We're given a view from above, like Elisha in the Old Testament, whose eyes were open and he was given a glimpse of the unseen world. Here in Revelation chapter 4, we're given a vision that will absolutely take your breath away, but it's real. It's the realest of real. It's the place where everything in the universe is seen rightly as it should be. This idea is conveyed in so many stories. So many stories around us are all communicating that there must be some other place. There must be some place beyond this space. Secular writers even imagine such a place. And so in the Netflix series, Stranger Things, there's the upside down. Or in the movie, The Matrix, there's this other invisible parallel universe that we cannot see, but it's all happening at the same time as everything that we can see. And once we see this other world, we can no longer unsee this other world. And so we need to make a decision today. 
We need to decide if we're going to take the red pill or the blue pill. We need to decide if we're willing to accept this invitation to come up here. We're going to need to decide if we want to step through this open door that John is about to step through. Because if you do, your whole entire universe is going to get turned upside down. So are you ready to step through the open door? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we might see all of the glory in this text. This is your throne room. Who can stand in your holy place, though? The scriptures tell us only those who have clean hands and a pure heart. That's none of us. But Lord, you in your word tell us there's one who can give us clean hands and who can give us a pure heart. And so we ask for his mercy today that you might show us what we need to see and that we might lift up Jesus Christ in this place. And we ask that for his sake and for his reputation. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Movement one, who's the one on the throne? In Revelation 1 and 3, you may remember we met uh, John and he had a vision from some angels and there were some keys. What we learn here is that those keys unlock a really special place. Revelation 4, 1, again, begins this way. It says, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, John says, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Now pause right there. Let's just make some observations right away here. Notice the words for seeing and beholding. That's going to be the repeated theme throughout this passage. Last week we covered in Revelation 2 and 3 that the key theme was hearing and listening, and we had to engage our ears. In this text, the key sense that we're going to be using is our sight. You're going to see this word repeated again and again and again. I see, I behold. There are things that we need to perceive here. The word means to have a deep attentiveness, to get our attention on this one up here who's on the throne. Do you see? What do you see? When you look all around you, I'll tell you what John's readers saw all around them. In the first century, John's readers, all they saw around them was the pomp and the glory and the power of the Roman Empire. It was everywhere. What they saw was militarism. They saw the Pax Romana. They saw the glory of Rome that wasn't built in a day. But here in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the Apostle John says, do you see what I see? Here we are given a a passage, a scene in heaven that's a worshipful scene, and this is what we need to see. Worship is primarily an act of our attention. It's, uh, it's giving our attention to the living God who is and who sees and who rules and who speaks and who reveals and who creates and who sustains and who orders and who blesses. He is the one who deserves our attention. May I ask you, what is getting your attention today? This is our whole problem, isn't it? You want to get a better marriage? Get your eyes on this throne. You need to be a better parent? Get your eyes off social media comparing yourself to other parents and get your eyes on this throne. You want to be a good worker? Get your eyes on this throne. You want to be a better friend, a better church member, a better elder, a better person? Come up here and get your eyes on this throne. Church, we got to take our eyes off of what's capturing our attention and instead look out. Look out to the distant horizon and see beyond the things that we see here. Now, I know we have an upcoming election in our nation and and that's important and, and we see that all around us and Christians need to vote and you need to register to vote and you need to vote your values and all of that's important. But whatever happens the day after the election, as believers, we need to come up here and look beyond the horizon and see what John sees because what he sees is those in the world that think they have a lot of power are not as powerful as they think they are. Their power is not as significant as they think that it is. In the year that King Uzziah dies, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Beyond all political thrones and political powers, that's where this throne resides. He sees something much more powerful. Or should I say, he sees someone who's much more powerful. And what does he see? The first thing he sees is a throne. The word throne is repeated 17 times in chapters 4 and 5. It's repeated 38 times in the book of Revelation. The term throne was used to describe a seat of authority. This throne has existed in eternity past. This throne existed in John's day. This throne exists today. And this throne will continue to exist forever and ever. This is the power center of the universe. 
In the Broadway Hamilton, there's this, there's this song about, I want to be in the room where it happens, the room where it happens, the room where it happens. This is the room where it happens. This is the throne room of God where everything happens. This throne apparently has a rainbow around it, probably like a halo, symbolizing the covenant God made with his child Noah. Even while God sits on his throne of judgment, he's surrounded by his own covenant promises that he has made to his people. This is not the only throne up here, by the way. Verse 4 continues in the text by telling us, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the throne were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. So we have one throne, do you got it? And 24 thrones around the one throne. The number 24 is probably symbolic. A combination of the 12 tribes of the Old Testament and the 12 apostles of the New Testament symbolizing the complete people of God around this throne. It's probably a symbol of the church triumphant. Doug Wilson in his book, When the Man Comes Around, a commentary on Revelation says, these 24 elders represent the elect of God throughout all of church history. Notice they're wearing white robes symbolizing these are believers who are overcoming and who have now been seated on their own thrones. In other words, this is a picture of the church that's done exactly what God told them to do in chapters 2 and 3, and now they have overcome and now they are victorious. In chapter 3, verse 3, we're told that they did not soil their garments. In chapter 2, verse 10, they were faithful unto death and have now received the crown of life. In chapter 3, verse 21, they've conquered and are granted the right to sit down on Christ's throne with him. Verse 5 continues in this amazing scene by telling us this. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. This throne is very active. This throne is very exciting. Lightnings, rumblings, peals of thunder. This is quite a scene. It reminds us of the scene in Exodus chapter 19, right before God gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19.3, we read this. 19.16, we read this, quote, On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. This is the scene of the presence of almighty omnipotent God. Can you imagine a display of such awesome power and majesty of the presence of God that we, do you realize what we're seeing right here? I feel like we should take our shoes off. This is holy ground. Do we realize who we're worshiping? Annie Dillard said about our worship in the local church, quote, does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? It is madness, she says, to wear ladies' straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. This is the one that we worship. Notice for you technical people here in the throne room is the presence of the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God. That's a symbolic reference to the Spirit's perfection. Notice there's seven torches. That's probably a reference to a heavenly menorah resembling the one with seven lights in the Jewish temple. Third, notice there's a sea of glass. That can mean one of two things. Outside of the Jewish temple, there was a bronze wash basin where the Jews would come and the priests would come for ceremonial washing purposes, and they would refer to that basin as the sea. But here, it's not a bronze basin. It is, it is a basin that's now in appearance like crystal, indicating that there's no more need for purification. Or secondarily, it could mean the actual sea, which in the Bible is often a symbol of restless chaos and turmoil, which is more likely in my opinion. But here, notice, in the presence of God, all is at rest. This is what we need. We need to come up here where God reigns and God rules and find a place of rest. This is where we can find our peace. If this is true, if this scene is real, and it is, what is there for us to worry about? Come up here. There's a throne. There's this space. When we worship here on earth, it's about creating a space in between our reality and that reality, if you will. When we worship, we enter something that's called convergent space. 
Convergent space is where heaven and earth touch together for a moment. It's the place where heaven and earth kiss. This is what corporate worship is. Have you ever been to this space in a place of deep worship or deep prayer or in your devotional time where you've entered into an in-between realm, in-between heaven and in-between earth, and it's almost like this place where heaven and earth touch? This is what worship is all about. We need to come up here and visit this space. What's going on up here is worship all the time in heaven, such that when we worship on Sunday morning, we simply join our voices with the ones that are already proclaiming the matchless perfections of God day and night, all day long. As beautiful as worship was today, and thank you so much, John and team, imagine what this worship scene is like in heaven. Notice also, we're not the only ones worshiping here. Verse 6 continues, by telling us this, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. Pause there for a second. The four living creatures is an allusion to Ezekiel chapter 1. For those of us who know our Bibles, you're very familiar with that scene. John's vision is completely dependent on Ezekiel's vision in chapter 1. They're not identical, but they're similar and interdependent. These are angelic beings, probably seraphim, the burning ones. There's four of them. Some say they refer to the four gospels. Some say they refer to the four corners of the earth, indicating God's glory covers the whole planet. Notice they have eyes all around. They see so much that we don't see, even in our age of globalization, even in our age of technology, we only see a small part of reality, but these living creatures have eyes all around. These four living beings are compared to animals, a lion, an ox, and one of them a human, and then an eagle. Now to understand what those symbols mean, you have to understand that Revelation chapter 4 is full of political imagery. John is a political prisoner. So in this chapter, you notice political images. There's thrones and there's crowns and there's imperial animals. They used animals back then as imperial symbols. Even today, we use animals as imperial symbols, don't we? There's the British lion. There's the American eagle. There's the Chinese dragon. These kind of symbols still convey a kind of imperial power. The one with a face like a man probably reminds us of the power of man with a more humanist worldview. The point here is that these are imperial, idolatrous powers that are all subject to the one that is on the throne. And so John is using these same symbols, but subverting them, saying all of the political powers bow down to this one power who is on this one throne right here. Let me remind you who's really in charge. Rome appeared at that time to rule all of the known world, but God rules in heaven on his throne. Notice, there's living creatures, there's angels, Humanity is like on the periphery of this scene. Our greatest leaders, at best, are playing some kind of understudy role. We are not the center of the universe. The one on the throne is the center of the universe, and he reigns. Like Psalm 99.1 says, the Lord reigns. Let those in earth tremble. Sorry about your God, but our God reigns. This is the message of Revelation chapter 4. Closest to the center are these living creatures. And there's this song or chant going on all the time. This is the first of five songs in this section. Two are in chapter 4, three are in chapter 5. Here's what they say. And day and night, they never cease to say this. Let's say the yellow together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord who was and is Let's just get this right so we have the antiphonal response. You guys do line one. You guys do line two. Just wait a second. First line goes like this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who was and is, and is to come. Let's try that. I messed it up. Okay, ready? Line one. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who was and is to come. Okay, let's get it right. Balcony, I don't hear you. Let's go. Holy, holy last time. Is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come all day 
night and day. This is the chant of the living creatures. More than any other attribute, the essence of who our God is, is holy. The word holy in the Bible means to be set apart. It means to cut off, like there's a separation. That's the idea, that God is vastly separated from us and all of his creation. This God is distinct. He is wholly other. He is totally other. He's a cut above. We're not on his level. He's holy in all of his ways. He's flawless. All of his works are holy. All of his judgments are holy. All of his decrees are holy. He is transcendent. He is above. That's what it means when we say God is holy. Notice the repetition three times. I'm indebted to R.C. Sproul for this observation. When the Bible wants to emphasize something, it repeats it. They didn't have bold or underline or highlight or italics or emojis or anything like that. They repeated for emphasis. And so sometimes you see repetition. When God calls Saul and knocks him off his horse, it's Saul, Saul. When David's lamenting his son, it's Absalom, Absalom. When Jesus wants to say something serious, he says what? Truly, truly, I say to you, the only attribute of God that's ever raised to the third power is holy, holy, holy. God in the Bible is not called love, love, love. He is never called justice, justice, justice. He's not called mercy, 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 but he is called holy, holy, holy. This is the one that we worship. Verse 9 continues, and whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who's seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Now, one of the primary words for worship in the Bible is proskuneo, which means to fall down prostrate on your face or to bow down before a dignitary. The idea is bending over as an expression of paying homage and respect. It is a posture of submission. In fact, I want to just get a volunteer for this just to show you what this would look like. Can I have somebody just volunteer to come up on stage just so I can show you what it means to bow down in the Bible? Somebody, anybody in the audience could help me out. I got Mr. Rick, yeah, come on down. Very good. Hey, give Rick a hand for being bold and helping me out here today. Thank you very much. Come on down. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just pretend, Rick, stand up here, pretend that I am a dignitary, I'm a king, and that you're going to pay me some respect. Really, I should be paying you respect, brother. But in this case, it's just an illustration. So go ahead and just bow down before me. So notice he took a knee. So now notice this position. Notice the, the willingness here. I'm not dragging him, kicking and screaming. He is, he's coming of his own will. And audience, what can I do to him when he's in this position? Anything I want to do with him when he's in this position. And this is what he's saying. What we're saying when we worship God is that, God, you can have anything that I have. All that I have is at your disposal. I am yours. This is the posture of bowing. Hey, can we thank Rick for, for doing that? Uh, appreciate you, brother. That's what we mean by bowing down. It's this idea that I'm giving myself completely to another, that I'm at the mercy of another. God, you can do whatever you want with me. I will not resist your will. That's worship. Now, part of that is a physical posture, but it's all the time a heart posture. Now, some people are more comfortable with this than others, but there's an appropriateness to physical posture in worship. And physical gestures are just a part of our lives. When we're watching sports and our football team scores, we may get up from the couch and put our arms in a V shape to celebrate what has just happened on the field. Why do we do that? Because physical expressiveness is just part of what it means to be a human being, especially when we're celebrating something. And so it makes sense that some of that posture would come into corporate worship, doesn't it? But I found that some Christians are simply unaware of what the Bible teaches about physical expressiveness in worship, or they've grown up in a church where they... They, they have practiced certain expressions but ignored other expressions. Or sometimes Christians restrict their expressiveness in worship because they're afraid of what others might think of them. That's not good. Psalm 134 verse 2 says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. So what that posture means, and it's a command by the way, is that I am to become dependent and grateful and reverent when I come to God's house in worship. So please don't assume that those who may be more physically expressive amongst us are trying to draw attention to themselves, nothing could be further from the truth. And since it's biblical, I would encourage you as we worship, if you're comfortable, to feel free to lift your hands and create an environment of freedom here. I find that that's important for me, that posture and worship. 
Now, I know in worship, we can veer off the side of emotionalism and we're sort of chasing a feeling. I'm not talking about that. But there are errors and there are problems on the other side of worship too, besides over-emotionalism, namely the total lack of emotions in worship too. That's actually a distortion that we need to avoid as well. And so here these elders are bowing down, worshiping the one who is worthy. The uh, opposite of this, of course, in the Bible is to be stiff-necked, which means to obstinately refuse to submit to someone in authority. And the children of God do this in many, many places. This is a posture of rebellion. This is when we don't want to worship God on the throne. Rather, we want to replace God on the throne, and we want to sit on the throne ourselves. Now, can you imagine the audacity of that and what that, what that seems like from God's perspective? I'll try to give you an illustration, and here's the best I can do. I'll just speak to the husbands in the room for just a second. Imagine you're married, and you get home from work one afternoon or one evening, and there's another man in your house. And you're like, hey, what are you doing? And the guy's like, you know, I've seen the way you treat your wife and your kids, and I think I could do a lot better job at taking care of your wife and your kids than you could. Well, how would that go for you guys? Would we not maybe have an altercation in the living room that night? Would there not maybe be a little bit of blood on the floor, perhaps? Would there not maybe be a helicopter landing in your front yard after that little incident happens that night? Yeah, why? Because that's not his place. Just like that, what I'm trying to say is when I sit on this throne as a human being, the audacity of that, the rebellious spirit of that in God's eyes is just as repulsive. When I set myself up as the king of my own castle, as the queen of my own little world, and I dethrone the God of the universe and do whatever I want to do, that's what the Bible calls sin. It's a refusal to surrender to the authority of the one who's on this throne. And this is why we need redemption. Worship is about assigning value it comes from the English word worthship, if you will. It's assigning ultimate value to God. Imagine, if you will, that you inherited a piece of jewelry from your parents. And let's say it came from their parents. And you decide that you're going to get it appraised one day, so you take it to one of those jewelers. And the jeweler starts to look into one of those special magnifying glasses that they have, and they start to notice colors, and they start to notice texture, and they start to notice the way your piece of jewelry refracts certain uh, parts of the light there. And all of a sudden, when he's looking at this piece of jewelry, he starts to get excited, and his breathing gets a little faster, and he suddenly realizes this is some lost ancient piece of jewelry, and he suddenly realizes the value of what he has right in front of him, and he realizes this thing is priceless. It's more valuable than the rest of the jewels in his shop and all the jewels he's ever seen with his eyes for his whole career. And then the jeweler comes to talk to you and says, do you know what you have? And the jeweler starts to explain what this thing is and you're amazed. And then you begin to realize that all along you haven't been living in accordance with what you had this whole time. This is what the Bible calls us to do when we need to recognize the worship of our God. We're simply not recognizing the value and the worth and the glory and the dominion of this one God who sits on the throne. Now, here's the thing. Everybody worships. Everybody worships something. Our our life is always oriented towards something. We always ascribe value to something. The world is not divided into people who worship and people who don't. The world is divided into people who worship the wrong things and people who worship the one true God. Nature abhors a vacuum. Becky Pippert says this, quote, whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks money is controlled by money. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by acceptance. We don't control ourselves. We are always controlled by the Lord of our lives. See, we are by nature worshipers. Everything we dream about, everything we think about, everything we sing about is always amplifying the value of something So Bible teacher Louis Giglio says this, quote, there's a trail of our time and our affections and our allegiance and our devotion and of our money. And that trail leads to a throne. And whatever's on that throne is what we truly worship. And so the question is not, are you worshiping? Everybody is. The question is, is what you're worshiping worthy of your worship? 
Verse 10 continues by telling us this, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, let's read it together, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor. For you created all things, and by your will they existed. Here's song number two. And here we're introduced to this word glory, which means weight or weightiness or heaviness. Remember Moses said, show me your glory. Here John gets to see a glimpse of the very glory of God. Notice he says, worthy are you, our Lord and God. Now those in the first century... They would have recognized those words. Those words would have introduced the emperor Domitian as he came to their town. Everyone would need to say those words. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, Domitian, to receive glory and honor and power. And so here, what John is doing is he's taking the words that the first century used to ascribe glory to the Roman emperor cult, and he's subverting them, and he's saying, no, 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 Domitian is not the one who you should be bowing down to. I saw the throne of the universe, and Domitian was not on it, so don't bow down. This last phrase, by your will they existed, is sometimes translated like in the King James, for thy pleasure they are. And I think that's a better translation. In other words, that's why creation exists, for his good pleasure. In other words, all of creation exists simply because he wanted it to. We exist, you exist, for one reason, the sheer pleasure of our God. He's the one on the throne. Movement two. We've seen the one on the throne. Movement two is this question, who's the one who's worthy? Now, chapter 5 is the second half of this vision, and chapter 4 was like setting the scene on the stage, and then chapter 5 is the drama. And so the curtain lifts, and here the drama begins with this question in chapter 5, verse 1, uh, where we read this, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Before we get to the question, let me just make some observations. We have this scroll and it's got writing on both sides of it. What is it? The Greek word is biblion. It's the word for book. It's where we get our word Bible from, by the way. But it's not the Bible. Well, what is it? Is it the Lamb's book of life? We see that elsewhere in the book of Revelation where all the names of the redeemed are written down on it. The list of people who are saved. I don't think so. Again, if you're familiar with your Bible, you realize this imagery is taken from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel sees a scroll that's exactly the same way, and it has writing on the front and on the back. Similarly, Ezekiel's scroll has a lot of the same characteristics. God tells Ezekiel, I want you to eat this scroll. Eat it? Yeah, eat it. Take my words on the inside of you and digest them, and when you taste them, you're going to notice they're both sweet and sour. Because the scroll contains messages of salvation and it also contains messages of judgment. The words of Ezekiel's scroll contain words of lament and woe. Similarly, when the scroll in Revelation is opened, and we'll see it get opened in chapter 6, by the way, he doesn't begin to read the names of the Lamb's book of life then. When it starts to get opened, he begins to release the judgments of God, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, horses which bring famine and disease and death. Pastor Bob will help us deal with those horses next week. The scroll, though is God's book of warnings and judgments and promises. The warnings and judgments and promises that apply to these last days. Daniel was told to seal up his scroll, but here in Revelation, John is told not to seal up his scroll, indicating that we are now living in the last days. And so this scroll contains God's plan of judgment and God's plan for the nations and God's plan to restore this whole world. And now we see the question, verse 2. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? A seal was a wax blob sealing a book. If this was an official document from a king, unless you had the authority given to you by the king, you were not to open this letter. So who can open the letter? Who can open the scroll? Now, opening the scroll means more than just opening it. It means more than just reading it. What it means here is who can execute the judgments inside of it? That's the question. Who is worthy 
to make good on all of God's promises and all of God's warnings? Who is worthy? Who can stand at the edge of the whole world, survey everything, and sum it all up? Who's worth, who can make good on God's plan for this world to come to pass? Who's worthy? Now, at this point, if we never read the book of Revelation before, we are on the edge of our seats. John is waiting to the answer for the answer to this question, waiting for a hero to come on the scene. There's this dramatic anticipation here. In ninth grade, we had to read the book, The Odyssey. You remember that character, Ulysses? The, the ancient Greek myth about Ulysses tells this story about after he, he had uh, gone to battle and there was this bow, the bow of Ulysses, and he'd gone through the war and everyone thinks Ulysses is dead and his wife Penelope is left to be a widow and she sets up this contest in the town to have another husband take her on as, as his bride and the contest is that there's going to be this bow, Ulysses' bow is going to be set up for a contest and all the men of the town have to come and try to bend the bow and all the men come parading forward for Penelope to try to bend the bow of Ulysses and no one can bend the bow. And then there's this old character that comes coming in from the back, this old man, and he walks up to the bow and he bends it with no problem. And the readers realize Ulysses is alive. That's the kind of scene we have here in Revelation. Who is worthy? Well, the answer in verse 3 is devastating. Verse 3, and no one in heaven or on earth, or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or look into it. None of the living creatures are worthy. None of the 24 elders are worthy. The record of the whole Old Testament is that none of those kings were worthy. All the kings failed. The great Nebuchadnezzar was not worthy. Alexander the Great was not worthy. Julius Caesar, not worthy. Napoleon Bonaparte, not worthy. George Washington, not worthy, worthy. No one, he says, in heaven or on earth or under the earth is worthy. And verse 4 has John's devastated response. He says, and I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And so John is wailing and he's weeping because he doesn't know if God's plans will ever come to pass. John looks out and sees the groaning and the mess of this world and there's no one to sort it out. History is just left to spin out of control. So much is lost and it would be. Could you imagine if there was no one? Can you imagine if there was no one to open this scroll, what that would actually feel like? John is profoundly disappointed. And so are we, because so much is lost. But, verse 5. Verse 5 says this. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, there's that word again. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so there's good news and John is relieved and he looks out. At this point, he hasn't seen anything, but he hears about this lion figure that's probably an allusion to Genesis chapter 49 where Judah was promised to be a lion's whelp. The line of the Savior would come through Judah. And he says it's from the, the line of Judah this person has come. And he's also a son of David. He, he was coming from the root of, of David. And so John is looking for this lion that would come. And John looks out and he doesn't see a lion. Verse, nine, verse 6. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 6. Look what he sees. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as if it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. I saw... Do, do you see what John sees here? John is waiting for a lion like Aslan to come rustling through and pounce onto the scene here. He's waiting for this magnificent beast to come, but then he sees that this lion is actually a lamb, as if slain. In other words, the way, the manner in which the lion has conquered is by becoming a lamb. The way in which the lion of Judah will conquer will be not through power or strength, but rather through meekness and sacrifice. In other words, what John is saying 
is that yes, our God has overcome. The lion has come, but he has overcome by his suffering and he has overcome by his humiliation. And this is why he is worthy. Because as Isaiah the prophet said, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He's not like the mighty beasts of imperial power. Nothing could be more subversive. This is how our king has conquered. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. He has not conquered through strength and might. Our king has conquered through weakness and through suffering. On earth, he appeared as a slaughtered lamb. But in heaven, John sees he's enthroned above all this lamb. On earth, he took on the form of a servant. He had no beauty or majesty that would attract us to him, nothing in appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But in heaven, John sees he's the one that's given the name above every name. Now, this is not a weak lamb. This is a powerful and mighty lamb and a wise lamb. The seven horns are a symbol of his power and his strength and his authority. In biblical symbolism, horns represent power. The horns of an animal, like a ram or an ox or a bull, or you're in New Jersey, right? Like a buck in your backyard. That's used to assert dominance. A horn was a symbol of power and strength and authority. So to have seven horns means that this lamb has all authority and he's perfect in power. Notice he also has seven eyes, referring to his ability to see all and to know all. This is talking about the lamb's omniscience, meaning our lamb is always able to see. Our lamb is always watching. This is who he is. Our God is the God who sees, as he told Hagar in Genesis chapter 16. We may be bewildered by the complexity of this world, but John says there is a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, and he sees everything. This is a very, very majestic picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now imagine if you were John. Let's say you were one of the 12 and you walked with Jesus as one of his 12 disciples as he took on flesh and you walked with him and knew him in his humanity. You would know Jesus as a human being, which is wonderful. And John was Jesus' best friend. But here, John sees Jesus in all of his glory. Imagine if you will, let's say if you had a neighbor who was an admiral in the Navy. And let's say normally you interact with him just like as your neighbor. Like you guys rake leaves, like you're taking out the trash. You guys talk to each other over the fence. He's just your neighbor. And, you know, maybe sometimes you guys go in the backyard and have some burgers and fire up the grill. And you get to know your neighbor as a friend, as a human being. And then one day, your neighbor, the admiral, shows up on your front doorstep on Veterans Day. And this day, he's in his whites and his creased pants, and his spit-shined shoes, and you see row after row after row of medals and accommodations, and you're like, whoa, I thought I knew you. I did know you, but now I really see you. This is John's experience. This lamb deserves worship because he's worthy. Verse 7, and he went And took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This is so encouraging. We're reminded here that our God hears our prayers. Do you realize who we're praying to? We're praying to the one who has seven horns and seven eyes. When you pray, you don't pray to somebody who needs to Google the answer. When you pray, you don't pray to somebody who needs chat GPT to help you out. You pray to the one who has seven eyes and seven horns. He knows all and he can do all. He's all powerful. As John Newton said, thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring for his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. And he holds your prayers in his hands. Here we have song number three, verse nine. It says, and they sang a new song. Let's say it together. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain. And by from every language and people and nation. And you That's a new song. We're not singing the song of Moses anymore. We're not singing the song of Deborah. We got a new song. 
A song about the lamb who is worthy. Remember, that's the question. Who's worthy? The answer is, worthy are you. Why? You were slain. And because of this, he's made us to be a kingdom of priests. We in the church are now taking on the missional identity of Israel found in Exodus chapter 19. We are now the kingdom of priests and we will reign. How do we reign? We reign the same way that our king reigned. We conquer the same way that our king conquered. We worship the one who conquered in his humility. And we, brothers and sisters, are called to follow in his steps. Verse 13 continues with movement number three. We've seen the one who's on the throne. We've seen the one who is worthy. And now we're going to see who are the ones who will sing. And in this last section, I'll be brief, but we see this huge, vast multitude. Song number four starts in verse 11. It says this, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads. Over lunch, you need to figure out what that number is. And thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, let's say it together, worthy is the to receive power and wealth and honor and blessing. These five songs of Revelation 4 and 5 are building to a crescendo. Just imagine, if you will, that the song starts quietly with a couple voices, a cappella singers, and then some other voices join in, and then some instruments join in, and then we have some trumpets and some percussion coming in, and then the altos are joined by the sopranos, and then Jackson Hulene comes in on the drums, and then John Bonaventura's belting it out, and Liz Gallagher's singing in the, the rafters, and we see this mighty, 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 triumphant, loud best concert you've ever attended here going on. All of creation now is joining in for the song of the Lamb. And notice, it's really loud in here. Song number five, verse 13. John says this, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, what? Let's say it, song number five. To him who sits on the throne... And glory and 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 the four living creatures said, what? Amen. Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. The picture I want you to see here is circles. There's someone on this throne, and then John keeps drawing circles around the throne. In the first circle, there's these four living creatures. And then in the next circle, there's these 24 elders around the throne. And then outside of that circle is another group of people that are gathered around to worship this this lamb. And then there's like an upper deck and an upper deck. It's like the biggest stadium you've ever been to. And all of these people are gathered around this one throne and they're all facing into the center because everybody in this crowd knows that the action is right there in the middle. And all of our attention is facing this one throne and the one who sits on this throne because he's the one who's worthy. Friends, that's why we gather once a week to worship together. We gather once a week to remind ourselves there is a throne at the center of the universe. And I got to remind myself that I'm not the one on the throne. I need a weekly reminder of that. There is someone on the throne. It is not me. And he's worthy of all my effort, attention, and all of my affection. And we gather with the voices of all of the created universe here, our loved ones who have passed away. We gather around this throne with them and worship together the one who's on the throne because he is worthy of our worship. And when we do that, when we gather once a week around this throne, we remind ourselves of our proper place in the universe. We remind ourselves in all of our humility of our proper place in the cosmos. And it's not on the throne. Our proper place is around the throne giving the one on the throne all of our worship. Say, Pastor Dave, what can I bring? You can bring something no one else can bring. Yourself. You can say, Lord, here am I. I bring my life as a token of worship to you. Romans 12.1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy... Because of the Lamb who was slain, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Can you imagine a church full of people 
who are focused in all of their lives and all of their attention around this one throne. Can you imagine a church who listens to this invitation to come up here to gather around this throne and remember the one who's worthy and to offer our lives to him? Let's be that church. Let me invite the worship team to come and lead us in worship as we prepare our hearts for the table and let's pray together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Our Father and our God, thank you for this wonderful invitation to come up here and to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ is the Lamb who was slain. And really, he's the ultimate jewel that we could ever have. And so right now, would you help us to properly value who you are in our hearts? This morning, we want to praise you today. We want to worship you. We give you thanks for your grace and for all the answered prayers that you hold like incense before your throne. We praise you for what you're doing here for over 174 years of faithfulness to our church. And we praise you for your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, we bless your name. We honor you. We glorify you. We say, blessed be the name of the Lord, for you are worthy of our worship. We worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen.